morning, and welcome to St. Paul's. It's good to see a very full house this morning. Ten years ago, Leonardo DiCaprio won an Oscar for his performance for Jordan Belfort in The Wolf of Wall Street, which was based on Belfort's mem memoir. And Jordan Belfort starts the movie with this introduction. The year I turned 26, I made $49 million. And it really ticked me off because I was three shy of a million a week. Belfort worked and lived in the next level excess, which was so prevalent in the 1990s. And he could be the icon of that cult of the next best thing. And we might never have his extravagant lifestyle, if you've seen the movie. But each of us have some part of Belfort in us. We aren't satisfied with what we have. We crave something else. We want more upon more. And even if you aspire on the other side to Mary Kondo, minimalistic simplicity, we covet her, perhaps, too. You know, unencumbered life, a clean closet. So either way, we are not content with what we have, and so we covet. Do not covet the Tenth Commandment, and that's where we are now at the end of our preaching series on the Ten Commandments. And starting back in June, we've been preaching through all these Ten Commandments, these first instructions that God gave to the nation Israel. Not as an ancient set of rules that is going to put a crimp on our life, and not putting a damper on that free life that we want. That wasn't the point. We've seen how these ten words can be roughly grouped into instructions how to love God, and also instructions on how to love our neighbors. And all of these 10 words together, they're what God gave us that would give us life. They point to something larger, something beyond themselves, and they open up the abundant life that Jesus promises all his followers. And so now we have this last one. You shall not covet, do not covet. So before we go any further, what exactly is coveting? It's not something that we use in our day-to-day -day life. We don't hear it in the news like murdering and stealing. So basically, coveting is desiring something that already belongs exclusively to someone else. So then, how does coveting make it into the top 10, these top 10 instructions that God gave us? Why is desire so important? So today, we're going to explore a little bit more about that, about how coveting isn't just an add-on. It's not just a forgotten appendix. But we'll actually see how this last commandment could actually be the linchpin that holds God's ten words as a beautiful necklace. It holds it all together. So to start off, the ten, this tenth commandment is more than just these four words, you shall not covet. It's more than that. And bringing us back, we have all these other commandments of the loving your neighbor. And those commandments are short and sweet. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. They're to the point. And this commandment feels like an essay in comparison. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, their male or female slave, their ox or their donkey. And just in case you were looking for that loophole, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. In modern day in Toronto, we don't have slaves, we don't have ox or donkey, but it's easy to covet someone's CV, maybe to covet the number of their direct reports. And we don't need the, do the donkeys or the oxen for farming anymore, but we can desire those new shiny cars in York Yorkville. Or if it's like me, you're maybe gonna covet those fancy bikes speeding along in the bike lane. We st definitely have houses, it's all over the news, Renters are coveting homeowners, and homeowners are coveting the debt-free. And don't forget things like Taylor Swift tickets, Leaf tickets, vacations, Michelin-starred reservations. And it's all over our feeds, and you, we even compare those. The number of comments, the likes, the tweets. Sorry, Elon, it's tweets. The TikTok views. We, co we covet those too. So 3,000 years ago, when God handed this commandment to Moses, we also had wives were considered as possessions. But now, today, if we're, we can easily covet life circumstances. We have the freedom of signalness, the happiness and length of someone's marriage, the obedience of children, or if you're lucky enough, the number of grandchildren. 
And don't forget attributes like age, looks, talents, and above all, physical health. So maybe an easy way to remember this commandment would be, do not desire something that belongs to someone else. And we easily have this connection between coveting and stealing. Someone has something you don't want, that you don't have? Well, make a plan. Take it. And that's the basis of this cruel story that we heard this morning that Melody read. Ahab, Jezebel, and Naboth. And this is the story that's recorded in Israel's first history book of kings, when Ahab is king of Israel around 850 B.C., And so Naboth has this vineyard. It's right beside the palace of King Ahab. And there's nothing special about it, but Ahab wants the vineyard, and he wants to convert it into a vegetable garden. There's a good deal. He's going to buy it, or he's going to give him an upgrade. But Naboth rejects this fair deal, and when Ahab can't get what he wants, he sulks away in resentment. And that's what Queen Jezebel notices. And we have here Naboth, his vineyard, and Ahab covets it, and then Jezebel is going to help with this plan. Ahab desires something that is not his, and Jezebel makes the plan. And it's a rather elaborate plan, because a vineyard isn't like a chocolate bar that you can just tuck under your jacket and walk out the store. So Jezebel cooks up a scheme with the nobles of the city, and we just hear the plan, but the plan goes off flawlessly. If there's a 160-character Twitter summary, it might go like this. Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard, Jezebel executed her plan, and then Ahab stole Naboth's vineyard. Ahab's coveting was the root of stealing Naboth's vineyard. He wanted it, made a plan, and then he took it. But in their scheme, Ahab and Jezebel broke a few other commandments along the way, and you would have noticed these. Because breaking the 10th commandment always means breaking other commandments. Sin, the sin of coveting is the gateway to so many other sins. And here in the story that we heard, Ahab and Jezebel, they started with coveting, but then they recruited two scoundrels. Two scoundrels, love that. Two scoundrels bearing false witness. And then they brutally stoned and killed Naboth. And in the end, yeah, They also broke the commandment of stealing his vineyard. But it's not just the evil kings like Ahab. We also have David, the best king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, and he covets. He covets Bathsheba, a beautiful married woman. He desires Bathsheba, a married woman, to the husband of Uriah. And his coveting also leads to breaking other commandments. If you know the story, there's adultery, and there's also murder again. Because breaking the Tenth Commandment always leads to breaking other commandments. And while we might not be as evil as Ahab, and we might not be a good king like David, but all of us, we covet. You see, the other, ten, the other nine commandments, they're all about external action, about making idols or honoring your parents, about murder, lying, and adultery. They all are about how we harm our relationship with God and how we harm our relationship with others. Someone gets hurt. That's how it makes it to the top ten. But the external actions are always coming from something internal. We all covet because the tenth commandment could actually be spelled out in a different way. Coveting is wanting the wrong thing in the wrong way at the wrong time and for the wrong reason. That is what the Tenth Commandment forbids, and we've all done it. It's true we do have wants and desires in our own hearts that are healthy and good. Whether we're spiritually searching or you've been a longtime member of this church, we are all created in the image of God, and so we start with healthy desires. We have desires for community. We have desires for intimacy, desire for beauty and for justice. But as Martin Luther says, covetousness is never satisfied. The more it has, the more it wants. People who are insatiable, unsatisfied with what they have, they injure themselves. They injure themselves and transform God's blessings into evil. A healthy hunger distorts into unhealthy gluttony. 
a quest for beauty and intimacy, it leads to lust. And if you followed the work of Oppenheimer, it's in the movies, go watch it, it's amazing. But if you've been following that quest, that desire for peace and justice like he did, well, that led to weapons of mass destruction and indiscriminate death. Our good desires are corruptible because desire starts in our hearts and our hearts are broken and corrupted by sin. And that's the heart of the matter. That's the heart of all the commandments. That's how coveting is the heart of all the commandments. We have Dante, that philosopher and poet from ages ago, who says that everything we do is motivated by love, by proper love, or distorted love. Everything we do externally starts in our hearts, whether it's a good desire or it's a corrupted desire. And this commandment that God gives, this commandment against coveting, shows us that God cares just as much about our external actions as much as our internal thoughts and our minds. We can lie to ourselves that no one gets hurt when we covet, but God knows. God knows all along, and we're eventually going to admit it when we see it, that our internal coveting, it sneaks out. It eventually manifests in ways to hurt those around us. The Apostle James writes, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Our corrupted desires, our coveting, they grow and they fester inside us into that resentment and hatred that we heard that Ahab experienced. And when they give birth to sin, the actions that hurt relationships with others and with God, and that sin, just like what happened with Ahab in that story, those actions, they lead to death. And not just for innocent Naboth, but also for Ahab and for Jezebel. Later on in the story, they die in punishment at the exact same spot that Naboth died. So throughout this series, throughout the summer, we've been talking about these minimums and the maximum of these commandments. How we can look to fulfill the commandments. And all the other commandments are a little bit easier to meet that minimum commandment, what is written in, those, in the text, those 10 commandments, because they focus our attention on how we control and how we regulate our external behavior. But how could we possibly do this with this commandment, do not covet? I can't just tell you, stop coveting, stop desiring this, stop desiring that. It's as difficult to say to a toddler as it is to us here as grown adults. Suppressing our desires is not the answer to that. So instead of attempting to suppress our desires, we can look at two different opposites of coveting. Two different ways that we can desire holy things. First, when you have those moments of envy and coveting, and you will have it sometime this week, maybe even sometime today, when that happens, stop. Stop and reflect on what you do have. Give thanks to God who gave those good gifts to you, your possessions and your provisions. And if you happen to be a king like Ahab, give thanks for the power and wealth you have. Or if you're the wolf of Wall Street, give thanks for the 49 million in the bank and not the missing three. God is the giver of good gifts, and so we can give thanks to God who provides our daily bread instead of being envious of the buffet that we don't have. And so instead of coveting that leads to death, we can bless others and give life. Instead of harboring ill will, we can desire goodwill. We can give and foster healthy desires towards others. So instead of taking and demanding for ourselves, we can serve and give generously. So throughout all the Ten Commandments, we've seen how God cares about both our external actions and our internal thoughts. And this last commandment is directed at our hearts and our minds, the thoughts and feelings that translate eventually into those actions. Coveting is about, the opposite of coveting is about giving thanks to God for the good things in our lives, the daily provisions that God gives us. 
And just as this commandment links to the so many others that we heard with adultery, murder, and stealing, it also joins back to the first one. God cares about what is in our hearts. That first commandment, have no other gods. And this one, have no unholy and corrupted desires. God wants our hearts to be free of anxiety, no longer enslaved by multiple gods, no longer enslaved by broken, corrupted desires, but set free to live the life that God intends and promises for us. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you care about every part of us, our bodies, our minds, our hearts. Thank you that in Jesus we have a king who does not covet and take, but one who gives his life to us. By your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would put your laws within us, write them on our hearts. And by the power of your son, Jesus, transform us from within to love you and to love neighbor. Put in our hearts your desires. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.